Previously in Chapter 9, we've covered temperature and thermal equilibrium. Now we're moving on to some methods for defining heat. This is section 9.2. I explained in the previous section that heat involves the movement of particles within a substance. Therefore, it involves a certain amount of kinetic energy. Heat and energy are closely related. We define heat as the energy transferred between objects because of a difference in their temperatures. And just to note, energy tends to travel from a hotter object to a cooler one. So we saw with a hot pan in water in the last section that as the hot pan became submerged in the water, its temperature would decrease to match the temperature of the water, while the temperature of the water would increase. This means that the pan is transferring its energy as heat to the water. Once the pan and the water have reached thermal equilibrium, in other words, their temperatures are identical, they start to transfer equal amounts of energy back and forth to one another. Because the objects are the same temperature and they're transferring the same amount of energy to one another, the net change in energy, which I've written as delta E net, is equal to zero. In other words, every time the pan loses a bit of its energy to the water, the water transfers the same amount of energy back to the pan, so the energy of both objects remains constant. And note that the unit for heat energy is Q. This is energy transferred as heat, and that matches up with the standard energy unit of joules. You can think of heat as being kind of similar to work in that both involve a change in energy. When an energy transfer increases an object's temperature, the situation is known as thermal conduction. For instance, if a pan is placed into the oven and it begins to heat up, it's gaining energy from the oven in the form of heat. Different materials have different rates of thermal conduction. Objects known as thermal conductors are substances that rapidly transfer energy as heat. In other words, they're quick to absorb and exchange heat. Thermal insulators are substances that slowly transfer energy as heat. So an example of a thermal conductor would be a metal pan going into the oven, which will heat up rather quickly. However, a cloth oven mitt that you use to remove the pan from the oven will transfer heat more slowly, making it possible for you to touch the pan without burning your hands. Aside from physical contact between objects, there are a few other ways that energy can be transferred as heat. The first is convection, and this refers to a situation in which hot air rises over a flame. This has to do with pressure, conduction, and buoyancy, which we will not be getting into in this chapter. Another transfer method is electromagnetic radiation. One example of this method is sunlight, giving off radiation to heat things that are on planet Earth. But for now, we're going to mostly focus on physical contact. So we've learned that heat is very closely related to work and energy. However, energy from heat is different from the standard kinetic energy that we've learned about previously. Energy that comes from heat is known as internal energy. This manifests itself in a few scenarios, including places where there's friction and inelastic collisions. In both of these situations, over here we see two cars crashing and sticking together, and over here we see a block moving across a rough surface. Some of the original kinetic energy of the objects is converted to internal energy, or heat. When we account for internal energy, total energy of a system is always conserved. We can write that the change in potential energy, plus the change in kinetic energy, plus the change in internal energy that results from any given situation will always equal zero. In other words, the net change in energy will be zero, so the overall amount of energy involved will never change. Here are some practice problems with heat and energy. Number one, a 0 0.003 kilogram penny drops a distance of 50 meters to the ground. If 65% of the initial potential energy goes into increasing the eternal energy of the penny, determine the magnitude of the increase. So this is the increase in internal energy. So first let's find the initial energy of this penny. It's going to start out with no kinetic energy, but it will be falling from a height of 50 meters, which means it has gravitational potential energy. This is written as mgh. The mass of the penny is 0 0.003 kilograms. We'll use 10 for g, and the height is 50 meters. If we multiply these three numbers together, we get that the initial energy is 1.5 joules. Now the problem says that 65 of this initial energy we'll go into increasing the internal energy of the penny. 
So 65% of this 1.5 will be converted to the total internal energy. So we'll rewrite 65% as a decimal, 0.65, multiply by the initial potential energy, which is 1.5, and we get that internal energy of the penny increases by 0.975 joules. Number two, at Niagara Falls, if 505 kilograms of water fall a distance of 50 meters, what is the increase in internal energy of the water at the bottom of the falls? And we're assuming that in this case, all of the initial potential energy goes into increasing the water's internal energy. So the water doesn't have any kinetic energy at the bottom. So like in the last problem, we're gonna start with gravitational potential. That'll be mgh. We know mass, that's 505, g is 10, and h will be 50 meters. This all comes out to 252,500 joules. So that's the initial gravitational potential energy. And then the problem states that all of this initial energy is converted to internal energy. So this will be the final answer. The water is left with 252,500 joules of internal energy.